And you know, we want to read some scripture. We have some scripture to read in the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. If you want to turn there with me. In the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. And the disciples, after that they had been with Jesus for so long. They had slept with Him. They had ate with Him. They had heard Him teach. They had traveled with Him. They had gone wherever that He told them to go. And now, in, as we observed last week, the Lord's Supper, this was after that they had commemorated or that they had instituted, if you will, the Lord's Supper. This would be the last time that our Lord would have Passover with them, but He said, This new commandment I give unto you to do as oft as in remembrance of me. And so we're going to start with the 24th verse of this same chapter. And this is going to be a pathway that Christ is walking that he won't go back to ever again. Except whenever that we read it in services like today. In the 24th verse of the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke, it says, And there was also, and this is after that they had partaken of the Lord's Supper, and after that uh, he had spoken to them, instructed them, there was also a strife among them. Now, can you imagine that? A strife among the disciples? And which of them, and this was the controversy, which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that setteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that setteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. In other words, I am your Lord, but I'm also a servant unto each one of you. And ye, have, ye are they that have continued with me in my temptations, that is, the trials that I'm going through and will be going through before that it's all ended. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and set on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel." Now this is where that our text is going to come from. And the Lord, uh, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon. You know, Simon, uh, Peter hadn't said anything, which was surprising, because usually he's one of the first ones to make a comment or first ones to uh, to say this or say that or rebuke the others. But the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, that is, whenever that you've kind of come back around, and whenever that you've come back to where I want you to be, he said, Strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am... Okay, here's where Simon, here's where Peter comes in. This is a typical answer. I am ready to go with thee both to prison and unto the death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We want to stop there for just a moment. We may continue on down into this chapter. But our text, as we said, will come from the 31st and the 32nd 
verses of this same chapter. And our thought will be based upon don't let the devil sift you. Don't let the devil sift you today. When I was a kid growing up, it always, anything fascinated me that was mostly electrical or electronic. I found out that an outlet will actually shock you if you stick a paper clip in it. But I would watch in the kitchen things that were going on. And one of the things that always fascinated me was whenever that my grandmother would take, and I, I didn't bring one with me today to illustrate it, but would bring a sifter with her. And it was always amazing to me. I always thought, well, why, why are you doing that? Just throw that fire on that dough, Grandma, and let's get on with it. Get, get the pie baked. But, you know, she sifted it. And it was interesting how that mechanically that flour would go through that sifter. There might be lumps, there might be clumps there, but whenever that it came out the bottom, it was very fine. There was no, uh, no lumps and no clumps together. There was no togetherness, if you will, of that flour. And you know, I learned a lesson out of that. And as we read this scripture today, he told Peter, he said, Satan has desired you that he might sift you as wheat. And you know, when you read in the original about you, whenever that he said, sift you as wheat, actually, that's in the plural. In other words, it was not meant for just Peter alone, but also the other disciples that were there. He was warning them and advising them that Satan was going to, after that he departed unto the Father, that Satan would try to sift them. That is to break them up. That is to individually come after them and also collectively. You know, I, I realize today whenever that we speak this, that people will say, well, preacher, I came for kind of, you know, with what's been going on and what happened and all that, I kind of came for a little bit more of an uplifting message than this. And you're telling me that Satan's on my trail? Well, you're a danger to him. You may not realize that today. Yes, he's the prince of the power of this air, of the air. But you are also a danger unto him because you are representative of what Christ can do in redeeming an individual. In other words, saving their soul from sin. And you're a danger to him today. Did you know that? You might say, well, he just tempts me and he just does this and he causes things to happen and on and on and on. Well, my friend, it's because it's like the bully. And you, you may not have had him in school, but it's like the bully in school who kept behind you poking with a pencil, you know, and just kept on and kept on and kept on. And then finally you had to get up and do something about it. I don't know if you ever had that kind of situation. But Satan is a coward and a bully, and he'll keep trying to come after you. He'll keep trying to discourage you. He'll keep saying to you, what is the use? We're just, I'm just one individual here. I am just one person. I've been saved by the grace of God. But with all that is going on, what can I do? It just looks like it's about to overwhelm. Have you ever seen a wave in the ocean or seen depictions of it? Boy, up close and personal, it just only took me one time to see a wave coming in, and I decided I really don't want any more of that because it was just, you know, oh, goodness. But you might feel today like what is happening and what's going on and the evil that is in the world, you might feel today like everything is just so overwhelming. You know, what can I do? Where do I go? 
Show me where there's a cave where I can hide in. That's always been my mantra. Show me a cave. But you know, today, I want you to realize there's one thing that Satan cannot separate you from. And he cannot break you up in. And I give this to you as instruction today, as encouragement today. Someone said, you're kind of a cheerleader preacher. You hand me a couple of pom-poms and I might even do a flip. <laughs> if it'll help you. Because that's what I'm here for. That's what God has called me to serve in. Is to help you today in these days in which that we live. The Apostle Paul said in one place, and I want you to realize today, you've been saved by the grace of God. Satan can't get your soul. That wasn't what Satan was after with Peter. That's, what he, that's not what he's after whenever that he tempts you and he tries you and he frustrates you and he angers you and he saddens you. That's not what he's after because he knows he can't get that. Paul said over in 2 Timothy in the first chapter, he said, I know in whom I believe. Do you know in whom you believe today? Do you know in whom you believed? Amen? Amen? Paul said, I know in whom I believed. And I am and I am persuaded. Paul, I want you to know he was right down to his sandals. 100% preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we said the other day, he was 24-7, 365 days out of the year when he hit the bed. He thought about where I can be sent to next. When he got up in the morning, he said, Lord, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to preach at? But Paul said, I am persuaded that he's able to keep that that I've committed unto him against that day. And I want you to know that the Bible also tells us in another place and Wednesday night we were asking about what your favorite scriptures are and what you think and how that it helps you. Someone must have known what was on my mind for this morning's text and sermon. Got up and said, I like 1 John 4 and 4. Or that it says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want you to know Christ has already conquered him when he died upon the cross. And someone will say today, that doesn't seem like much of a victory. Oh, it was because it was a victory over sin. It was a victory over death. And he proved it by his resurrection from the dead. My friend, oh, grave, where is thy victory? Paul said in one place, oh, death, where is thy sting? Christ conquered it. And my friend, he gives unto us uh, the salvation in Ephesians chapter 1 in the 13th and 14th verses. He says, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Have you ever seen an official seal? Whenever I got documents, there'd be a seal usually imprinted in the paper. And that made it official. And you know, the Bible tells us you were sealed. When you were saved, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That seal is upon your soul. You're not the property of Satan anymore. You're the property of the Lord Jesus Christ, of God. And he said, this is the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Satan can't get that. Do you know what he would, what he would have to do in order to get at your soul? He'd have to go through the blood, and he's not going to do that. And he'd have to go through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's second, he's second in this world as far as evil is concerned, but he cannot outdo God. And my friend, he would have to take you out of the clutches and out of the hands of Almighty God. And that's not going to happen. But I will tell you what he will do. You know, sometimes as a child of God, our 
battles with Him and with the evil in this world comes actually after that we've been saved. And you might say, oh Lord, don't tell me that. I will go in a cave with you telling me that. But no, no, greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. If you don't go away with anything else, go away with that. Keep it upon your mind. Repeat it over and over to yourself. These scriptures that we've given unto you today, keep them upon your heart. Keep them upon your mind. Whenever the problems come, don't let it dislodge you or don't let it shipwreck you. Because I want you to realize today he can do a lot of things, but what he will work on is trying to sift you like grain. In fact, over in Amos chapter 8, and in the eight, excuse me, Amos chapter 9, there's an illustration there of how that God spoke and said, I will shake the nations, I will shake Israel like grain through a sieve. But he said, but you will be preserved, speaking to Israel today. So it's that kind of sifting. It's, it's kind of a tearing apart. He'll try to pair, tear apart your confidence in God. Do you know whenever that he tempted and he afflicted Job, do you know what he was trying to get Job to do? What was spoken of in Job, where someone told him, Job, you got boils all over. And let me tell you, they hurt. You got boils all over you. Your family's been decimated. You've lost all of your wealth, your children, everything. Why don't you just sit right down and curse God and die? Do you know, in essence, that's what Satan will tell you to do? And I know you won't curse God, but I do know this. It'll plant a little seed of doubt within your mind. Does God still love me? Does God, is God still with me? Is he going to help me through this affliction that I'm going through? What my family is going through? What our country is going through? Is God going to be with us? And he'll try to get and he'll meditate that and meditate that and meditate that upon your mind to the extent you'll start believing him. You know, you actually can tell a person who's healthy so many times and doctors will tell you the same thing. If you tell a patient who, who's healthy that, oh, you got this, you got that and keep repeating it over and over and over and over again, pretty soon that individual will start taking on the characteristics and the symptoms of that disease. It's not that they're hypochondriac, but the doubt has been put in their mind. And that's how it is with Satan. He would, he would follow Christ everywhere that he went. And there were times whenever that Christ would stop and he would say, Satan, get thee behind me. Have you ever talked to the devil? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not I, I realize that he's powerful. But I do realize today that my Savior is even more powerful. And I want you to know, my friend, that he crushed the head of the serpent upon the cross of Calvary. And the finality of it will be, and you read in the 20th chapter of the book of the Revelation, where that he and the false prophet and also the beast were cast into the lake of fire, into the abyss. Whenever that Satan tells you today that, oh, you're nothing. You can't do anything. You're, you're weak. You're this. You don't have this talent. Just go over and read that scripture to him. And I want to tell you something. He'll back off. Flee, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. My friend, he desires to sift you, even as we. He'll get you to try to doubt the promises of God. All the promises of God, Paul says over in one place, are yea and nay and amen. 
There's more positive things within the Scriptures than there are negative things. And some of the negative things that are in the Scriptures are things to help us avoid falling by the wayside and, my friend, going to utter destruction. He'll get us to doubting one another. Did you know that? He'll get us to wondering... I wonder about so-and-so over here. Um, I used to be the world's worst. My, I, I'm working on it. I don't know that I've achieved it. But I used to see, some, see somebody, and I don't know why it would enter my mind, that person's against me. You know, that person's out to get me. He looked at me wrong. <laughs> she looked at me wrong. She didn't say excuse me when she walked in front of me. I, I doubt if that ever happened to you. I'm just kind of confessing this. But my friend, I want you to know, he'll get us to doubting one another. He'll get us. Do you know why? Because he knows that a united church, he knows that people united in Christ with oneness. And my friend, one thing upon their mind, he knows it's a danger unto his kingdom. Do you know today that the Bible tells us over in one place, it says that Jesus commanded the disciples, occupy until I come. Now that wasn't just for the disciples, that's for us. My father's told me about invasion processes during the Second World War. You know, and I've, I've kind of marveled. And some of that territory, I want to tell you, that's why that we honor those men that lay their lives upon the line for our country because some of them had, did not make it home but my friend they established a beachhead and they and that's why uh, there's so much on my mind today I just don't know if I'll get it all preached you may have to come back next week or this afternoon if somebody's going to get pizza I'll just go right on <laughs> But I want you to realize today that we're trying to establish and hold a position. It always amazed me when I, and I get choked up when I watch it. So I, when I watch something like Saving Private Ryan and how difficult it was to establish a beachhead and to make the progress that they did, I just swallow hard. I don't know that I could have done it. But right into the face of the enemy, my friend. Not, I'm not trying to be dramatic, and I've gotten completely maybe off course, but I want you to realize something today. We're in the same kind of battle. We're trying to hold this beachhead. We're trying to occupy until when? Until when? Till he comes. Exactly. We're to hold this until he comes. And in the meantime, we're to gain as much territory as we can. And you say, well, I didn't ever think that the gospel and the work of the Lord was like a battle. Oh, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in the book of the Ephesian letter. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand. Take unto you uh, the helmet of salvation. He said, take unto you the shield of faith that you might be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. Do you know that Roman shields were made not just of metal, but they were made of metal and also parts of leather? And they'd go and soak those, those shields in water before they'd go into battle. Why? Because they knew that the enemy was going to be shielded shooting flaming arrows towards them, and that would quench the fiery arrows of the enemy. My friend, Satan is going to be shooting flaming darts at you, but you've got the shield of faith. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I don't know why I keep quoting that, but I want you to get it down in your heart and in your mind that my friend, no matter what's going on around about us, no matter what's happening, Christ is winning the victory 
And my friend, we're to have the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and I'm going to get to that later, but uh, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, which is the righteousness of Christ, imputed unto us by the Holy Spirit. Your righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. You are girt about with the truth. Jesus said in one place, He said, sanctify them father with thy truth thy word is truth today and to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace <laughs> that's a lot of armor isn't it but Paul said we're fighting a battle we're contending for the most precious thing that there is in this world today and that's the souls of lost men and my friend to establish my friend that there is a right and there is a wrong there is a black there is a white there is no gray my friend it is according to what God says is right and what God says is wrong and my friend no amount of legislation today will ever change that in the government of God. God's not going to, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, they passed a law that says this is okay now. Well, I better go back to the Ten Commandments there. And I, I, I better amend that. No, it's established. It stands. Even whenever that they put those tablets into the Ark of the Covenant, they didn't go back to it and say, well, let's just open up here. You know, we, we're, we're in Canaan now, and, uh, you know, we got these others that are living with us now, so we're on. Yeah, we don't want to offend anybody here. So here, uh, jo Joshua, you do it. No. No. Doesn't work that way. Somebody said one time, there are no absolutes. I answered them and said to them, even that is not absolute. There are absolutes today. There's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shine. That's an absolute. And there's only one way of salvation, only one way for people to be saved, and that is by, through, and in the blood of Christ Jesus. My friend, this is what needs to be preached in our pulpits and my friend our evangelistic efforts or whatever is the precious blood of Christ being shed to atone for man's sin because my friend that's what God's looking for whenever that we get to heaven he's looking to see has the blood been applied the blood of what bulls and goats no of Christ Jesus so I don't know where all that came from, but nevertheless, I want to say this today. He'll try to cause disruption within your heart. He'll try to separate you from God. That is speaking of Satan. He'll try to separate you from his word. He'll try to get you to leave the Bible alone. Don't let it collect dust. My friend, in fact, get you several Bibles. Put them in every room. You can ask my wife. I'm, I've got one even in the bathroom. And my friend, be ready with that word. Study it. Read it today. It's God's gift unto us. And don't get caught up with these, these people that say, well, do you think it's actually true? You know what it says in Psalms? It says, His word is established in heaven forever. My friend, I want you to know there's no error in it because it comes from God. God spoke it and wrote it down. And I want you to know it stood the test of time. And you know, like this country, that people died for freedom. There were men that died to be able to bring this Bible to us down through the ages of time. Some of them were burned at the stake because they printed this Bible to where that the common individual, you and I, could read it. And you know, there was one man that they hated so much that after that they burned him and put his ashes in the ground, they hated him so much, they dug his ashes up and they threw him in a river. That's hatred. That's what's permeating 
our, our society and culture today. But get yourself acquainted with this book and the promises that God has in it for you. And surround yourself with it. Saturate your mind with it today. Listen to gospel music. Listen to hymns. I want you to know that there's comforting messages in those hymns today that speak to us. Pretty soon they're going to have a, a play about Fanny Crosby. Do you, know, you know who Fanny Crosby is? She wrote the majority of our hymns that we sing in the book. Do you know Fanny Crosby was blind? And she wrote such hymns about, And I shall see him face to face And sing the story saved by grace. How can somebody that is blind say something like that, write something like that. It's because she got face to face with Christ, my Savior. Oh, brother, I'll tell you, this is blessed. This is blessed. Listen to hymns today. My friend, sometimes I have to put some of them kind of on the back burner and listen to the hymns. But you know I'm blessed whenever I do it. And you need that. You need that because the world is going to, Satan is going to use the world to filter stuff into your heart and into your soul. And you know, there's where his seed causes doubt, causes fear, causes discouragement, causes depression. Wednesday nights, we're, we're, we've been teaching about the three things that afflict people oftentimes, and I include myself in that too. We talked about anxiety. The, the, the Philippian letter is filled with encouragement from the Apostle Paul about anxiety. We're going to look at discouragement and depression and fear. The worst of them, I think, is fear. But nevertheless, we want to encourage you to be here for that. It starts at 7. And we would love to have you. But the next thing is prayer. Prayer, I read, I heard a song one time that said, prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. I've oftentimes, and I, I've not researched it, how many times did Christ pray? He went off and he'd pray. He'd go off and he'd pray. He'd go off and he'd pray. He'd go off and he'd pray. And even so that his disciples said, will you teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray? And he taught them to pray or gave them kind of a template for it. Satan will try to get you to stop praying. He'll get you, he'll try to get you to stop looking to God. He'll get you to doubting God so much that you'll put prayer and Bible reading and all of this way over here is the second alternative to turn to. That's what he'll do. And that's where the sifting process that he uses begins because it co will cause disunity between you and God. He'll break up the lumps of that fellowship between you and God. It'll break up the lumps of the, of the love of the Word of God. And it'll cause a disunity of your feelings towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you might say, why do you emphasize that? Because brother, brothers and sisters, we need to pray for one another. We need desperately in this day and time to pray for one another. My friend, you ask God to give you somebody to pray for. He'll give you somebody to pray for. I've had instances of where that someone would come across my mind I hadn't thought about in years. 
and God would just move on my heart to get on my knees or to pull over the car and pray for them. And then I'd find out years later that they were going through some sort of hardship. My friend, I want you to know that Christ prayed for you before in the 17th chapter of the book of John, knowing what you and I would face. He prayed for us. He prayed that, that we wouldn't get discouraged. He prayed for us. And, he, and you might say, how do you get that? He said, I pray not only for these, that is these disciples, but he said, those who will believe on me through their word. That's you and I today. So my friend, as we close our few remarks today, I kind of gotten here, there, and yonder, but Satan is going to come at you. Don't be discouraged because God's given you and gives you and has available to you everything that you need to be able to stand up against Him. God saved you by His grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. He broke the power of sin. You have a home in heaven because of the blood that was applied to your heart when you were saved. You're a child of God. And He's going to give you the tools that you need to be able to be. And my friend, when you see a brother or sister going through a hard time, that it looks like they're being sifted. It looks like that Satan's working on them. Pray for them. Pray for them. And even better yet, go to them and pray for them and read the scriptures to them. God bless you, each and every one is my prayer. I love you all. I know I get kind of fanatically arm waving all that. I'm, I'm just. You can tie my hands to my side and I can't say a word. <laughs> but I get so sometimes so enthused I can't help myself. I just get so enthused about the Lord, about God, and about you all. You know, today I love you all. You know why? You've been bought with a price. You have the blood applied unto your heart. You're a child of God. Somewhere in your life, you bowed your knee before Almighty God and said unto Him, Oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And He heard that prayer. Whosoever, the Bible says, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not, he, he doesn't hold the carrot out and said, well, now, Paul, you just didn't jump far enough. Oh, Paul, well, you, you do this, you do that. Do you know what he requires of us in salvation? That we repent and we believe on him with all of our heart and he will save today. I got a born again experience, my friend, whenever that that happened to me. I've heard of people being saved in a pickup truck. I've heard of people being saved in an altar. I've heard of people being saved as they were coming down the aisle. I've heard of people being saved as they were driving in a car. You'd be surprised. But then again, maybe not. Because God can do all things. He saved John Newton. You know where he was at? John Newton had the, wrote Amazing Grace. He'd been swept overboard off of a slave ship into the water. And they had no life preservers. So they had to use a harpoon. And they threw it out there and it just happened to get his leg. That's how they hauled him back into the ship. But somewhere in that water, John Newton called upon God. And that's why he was able to pin that song we love so much, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.